Got a nice crowd this morning. Are we excited about, I tell you what, the presence of God was really good in the worship service this morning. I just, I'm just so thankful for the presence of the Holy Spirit. I lived many, many years and never experienced the presence of God in church. And it's so glad that we can come and experience the presence of God. You know what? If we're not careful, we just take that for granted. And we don't ever need to take that for granted, do we? We need to, we need to covet the presence of God in our, in our church, in our services. And He is here. And I believe He's going to be here in the message today. I, I trust that your hearts are open and that you're receptive. We're talking about rethinking your life. We started last week and we... The title of last week's message is Why You Need to Think About What You Think About. Why You Need to Think About What You Think About. And we're building this series on uh, nine, uh, nine different things. And, and let me tell you those real quick. We talked about this last week. It, this message is on our YouTube channel. If, you, if you've not listened to it yet, go back and listen to it. But my thoughts control my life. But I can control my thoughts. God gave us a wonderful brain. And we, we looked at the scripture last week that, uh, that we're supposed to guard our hearts because it determines the course of our life. And it really does. What we think determines the course of our life, the way that we think. We're not talking about mind over matter. We're talking about something that God put in us the brain, the, I say the brain, the mind, the, the brain is the physical organ, and it, it's tremendous within itself. But the mind, the, the, what the, the brain and the heart puts out together is, is tremendous in the direction of our life. And it, it, it is determined by that. And it's, you know, with the old term G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you put garbage in, garbage comes out. If you put good things in, good things come out. So we need to control what we allow into our minds. My thoughts control my life, but I can control my thoughts. Number two, any change I want in my life must start in my mind. It doesn't start by just trying to change our actions that doesn't work. You have to change the way that you think, and then, guess what? The actions follow the thoughts. I can change how I feel by changing how I think. Feelings are not good indicators of reality. F feelings can be fickle, and uh, a lot of people live by their feelings, and they get messed up. They get deceived. They get you know, so many bad things can happen if we just live by what we feel. We need to live by what we think. And I can change how I feel by changing how I think. I've had to use this in the, in the area of forgiveness. I've had people who have stabbed me in the back. I've had people who have hurt me in 40-something years of pastoral ministry. And I had to make the choice to forgive. Number one, because God said we must forgive. If I don't forgive, then God won't forgive me. So I had to make the choice to forgive. I did not want to forgive. I wanted to strangle. I wanted to mutilate. I wanted to hurt somebody. But that's not God's way. Who does vengeance belong to? It belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. So I had to make the decision to forgive. My feelings didn't change when I made the decision to forgive. But every time those feelings would pop up, I would say, nope, I have forgiven. I have forgiven. And I can honestly say, I don't harbor any hard feelings towards anybody that I can think of right now. And I've had some pretty bad things done against me, said, said about me, said against me. Uh, try to uh, uproot my ministry, and and I've I've had to I've had to deal with that, and I and I changed my feelings by changing the way that I think. 
Okay. Every behavior is based on a belief. You act on what you believe, good or bad. So every behavior is based on a belief. Anytime I sin at that moment, I'm believing a lie. God's word is true. It's truth. And anytime I sin, I go against truth. So I'm believing a lie. The next one, an unseen war is going on in and for our mind. The battle is not out here. The battle is not demons in heavenly places. The battle is what takes place between our ears. Okay? I know that there are demons out there. But they don't have to affect. If, if they affect what's in here, then that's, that's where the battle takes place. And so we, ha we have a warfare that we're fighting. To win the battle in, in and for our mind, I must have God's spirit and God's word inside me. And this is where a lot of Christians balk because most Christians don't read their Bibles. Most Christians do not read their Bibles. A small percentage of, of Christians read their Bibles. But, you know, the input of the word of God, uh, it's amazing what it will do for us. I, I put on something at, at night when I go to sleep, and last night I didn't do this on purpose. I had something else going, and it went to the next thing on my phone. And somebody was reading the book of John. And my whole, well, for two hours, it, it seemed like forever, in my dreams, I could hear the book of John being played. I was dreaming about somebody quoting the book of John. I was dreaming about somebody else talking and I was somewhere else and I could steer, still hear the book of John. I heard that in my subconscious. We have to put God's word inside of us. And it's amazing. You know, if you'll st store the word of God in your heart, David said, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you'll put the word of God in your heart, when a temptation comes or a problem comes, it's amazing how a scripture will just pop up in your mind. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But the, if the Holy Spirit don't have anything to draw on, it won't happen. If you'll systematically put the word in your heart, then, then in that time of need, the Holy Spirit will bring that scripture to your remembrance. So you know, that's what, that's what in the armor is called the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the rhema of God. It's the revealed will of God, the, real, the revealed Word of God. And it'll come to you in that time of need. And that's, that's how we ch change the way that we think. Here's the last one, and this is the important one. Rethinking my life to match how Jesus thinks is called repenting. Repent does not mean what we've always thought it meant, that we're supposed to... You know, be sorry and cry. and I mean, that may be part of the process, but I know a lot of people who, who, who cry and pray and, and they're not changed. The word repent means to change the way we think. That's what it means, to change the way we think. Our actions are not going to change until we change the way we think. And... Uh, that's a big part of what we're going to be talking about in this whole, in this whole. And my goal, here's the ninth one, my goal is to learn to think like Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Learning to think like Jesus. Paul said in, in Corinthians, he says, we can understand these things because we have the mind of Christ. The scripture tells us that we have, as Christians, we have the mind of Christ. We call it the MOC, the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 5 says, in, in your lives you must think and act like Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us to think like Jesus. When you think like Jesus, you're going to think higher thoughts. You know that? See, don't be a pawn when you're meant to be the king. You're not meant to be a pawn. You're, you're meant to be like a king. John Callow Perry, our, our men's basketball coach, told this story the other day. He was talking about his, 
his team. He has to change the way that they think but so, so that they can succeed on the court. He told the story of Arnold Palmer. Anybody know who our Arnold Palmer was, the great golfer? Uh, after he retired from, from uh, golf, he started building golf courses. And uh, he went to the country of Bahrain to build a golf course. And after he got it done, he was invited to come and visit the king. And as he went to go into the king, somebody told him, said, Now listen, if the king offers you a gift, accept it. You've got to accept it. Don't say no to the king. You say yes to the king. So he goes in and he visits with the king. And sure enough, the king says, uh, thank you for, for what you've done here. What can I do for you? What can I give you? I want to give you a gift. What can I give you? And it kind of took him aback because he thought maybe the king had picked out a gift. So he thought a minute and he says, I would like to have a golf club. And the king said, okay. So they, they shook hands and Arnold goes home and uh, so he pictured in his mind that in a few weeks that, that he would get this golf club that had diamonds in it and a, and a golden, uh, you know, gold head, and he could hang it on his wall, and he could tell the story. He said, but a couple weeks later, he got a letter that was thanking him for coming and what he did. And he asked his secretary, he says, well, was there a package? She said, no. So he went to put the letter uh, back in the envelope, and he noticed another piece of paper. He pulled it out and opened it up, and it was a deed to a golf club. And the whole thing is, kings think higher than normal people do. And let's say this, Christians should think higher than non-Christians. See, we have the king living in us and we need to learn to think like the king amen we need to learn to think like the king so don't be a pawn when you're meant to be a king we're going to look at several things here that how we learn to think like jesus uh, See we, see, we don't need to live the same day over and over again and call that a life. Life is about evolving mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. We need to be growing in our relationship with God. We need to be growing in our thought life. Most people spend their whole mental life reacting to things that are around them. You know, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus made things happen. He made things happen. He thought on a different level. And we're going to look at this from his perspective. And we're going to look at, at, at several things. Number one, Jesus knew exactly who he was. So our first, our first pillar here is, I know exactly who I am. I have to learn exactly who I am. See, Jesus knew who he was. See, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the true vine. I am the Son of God. He knew who he was. You know, he never did say, I, I'm the president. I'm the senator. He didn't get involved in certain things. See, he stayed with who he knew he was. He was the Son of God. He came for a purpose. And that's the, that's the second pillar on which we, we're going to build this is that he knew God's purpose for his life. And if we're going to learn to think like Jesus, we need to learn what our purpose in life is. Now, if we go back to the first one, I say, well, who am I? Well, I know who I'm not. I am unique. I am one of a kind. So are you. 
So why do we try to be like somebody else when God made us one of a kind? Are you, are you with me? All we, all we become is a, is a poor imitation of somebody else. There's only one Whitman. Thank God. There's only one Whitman. And God has a purpose for Whitman's life. Now, first of all, we have to discover who we are. I know who I am. I am a pastor, teacher. I am a husband. I am a father. I am a grandfather. That's who I am. That's what God made me. We have to discover who we are. And sometimes we have to eliminate who we are not. I'm not a politician. I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. So that learning who I am helps me to stay in my lane and discover what my purpose in life is. See, Jesus knew what his purpose in life was. In John 8, 14, I know where I come from and where I'm going. He said in Luke 2, 49, I must be about my father's business. He said, I must proclaim the good news about God's kingdom, for I was sent for this purpose. We have to discover our purpose. John 10, 10, my purpose is to give life in all of its fullness. Aren't you glad that that's what he came to do? And that's why we have life today. So what's our purpose? We need to ask ourselves these questions. What is my purpose? I know part of my purpose is defined by who I am. I'm a pastor and a teacher. My purpose is to love people, teach people, to add value to people. I'm not to live just for me. I'm to live for other people. Isn't that all of our purpose is to live for other people? Your purpose may be different than mine. See, we need to discover what our purpose in life is if we're going to think like Jesus. Otherwise, you're just going to kind of stumble through life reacting to every circumstance and situation that comes your way. You know, some, there are some things in life you have to resist. There are some thoughts that come to you that, that you have to resist. God didn't call me to do what Jason is doing. Now, he called me to help Jason do what, do what he does, but he didn't call me to do what somebody else is doing. All the time, I have people come to me and say, Hey, Pastor, I've got a good idea. I've got this thing that we need to do. I know what that means. I've got this thing I need you to do. <laughs> See, they're trying to put their purpose off on me. Listen, if you conceive the baby, you raise it. A lot of people will say, Okay, here's what we need to do. And they're saying, Pastor, here's what you need to do. No, that's what you need to do. And if I can help you do that, then I'll help you do that. But it's not my responsibility to fulfill your purpose. It's your responsibility to fulfill your purpose in life. Now, I've done lots of things in ministry. I have cycled in and out of certain things that I have done through ministry. But basically, my ministry is to preach the gospel. It's to love people. It's to add value to people. It's to be a blessing. That, that's a general thing. There are other specific things that, that becomes our purpose. But we all need to discover what our purpose is. Don't live a life just for self. Purpose is something that's outside of you. Purpose is something that's bigger than you. And it has... It has little to do with your own happiness and your own contentment. It has to do with adding value to other people and being a blessing everywhere that we go. We can do that if we would just think about it. And you begin to think about that. It's amazing that God will bring people across your path that you can pour into. 
You don't have to preach to them. You can share your story. You, there's, there's so many different things that we can do. Some of you are working in jobs that you're fulfilling your purpose. You're adding value to people. You're doing it in a unique way. See, this is the thing that there's none of us that are, are, are alike. We may be similar, but, but we're different. And our purpose can be as diverse as our personalities, as our giftings, as our callings. And uh, there will be no two people that do the same thing the same way. That's what makes it neat. That's why God builds the body and puts it together with each joint supplying and working together in unity and harmony, fulfilling the purpose of Christ. See, when we, when we learn our purpose, that purpose is found in our relationship with Christ. And if we're going to think His thoughts, we've got to be in a good relationship with Him, don't we? Merciful sakes. Number three, I'm always aware that God is with me. You know, sometimes we live like God's nowhere around. Well, guess what? He's right there with you all the time. John 16, 32, Jesus says, I'm not alone because the Father is always with me. He had this mindset that God is always with me. I am never alone. God is always with me. When I feel alone, alone, I'm not alone. Why? Because God is always with me. When I'm tempted, guess what? I'm not alone because God is always with me. And if we're thinking like Jesus, God's here. I better make some good choices here, hadn't I? Are you with me? Okay. So God is always with us. You know, Jesus often slipped away to be alone with God and commune with God. And, you know, to be aware that God is always with us, we need some alone time with God. It may be five minutes. It may be ten minutes. It may be an hour a day. But we need to set aside some time that is just us and God. Us and God. I'm an early morning guy. I, my, I have a routine that, you know, when I get up out of bed, I take my shower, I come to the office, and I have some alone time. Me and God. In His Word, I allow God, the Word of God, to speak to my heart. Sometimes I, ju I just talk to God driving down the road. It's not hard. But it, it, it's something that we need to cultivate in our lives because God is always there. He is always there. And sometimes, we, wherever we're at, we forget that God is with us. We need to remember God is always with us. Number four, I let God, this is a big one, you ready? I let God help me choose my words. You ever give somebody a piece of your mind? That's not the mind of Christ. You ever just, just you just spout your opinion, you just, whatever comes, you just, wow! That's not thinking like Jesus. John 12, 49, Jesus says, I have not spoken my own on my own. Instead, the Father who sent me tells me what I should say and how I should say it. See, we, if we're aware that God is with us, He'll tell us what to say in circumstances and situations. But we let our emotions get involved sometimes. We let our opinions get involved sometimes. Sometimes we just need to shut up. That's not good to say, is it? The best thing you can do is just shut up. And wait for God to lead you and guide you in what you need to say. That's what Jesus did. I'm sure that he got frustrated with people sometimes. I'm sure that our Heavenly Father <laughs> gets frustrated with us sometimes. But if we'll let him guide us, if we learn to think like Jesus, we'll say what he wants us to say 
and not what we want to say. Number five, here's a big one. You people pleasers, I don't worry about pleasing everyone. You know, we got four to six hundred people in this church. We don't always make everybody happy. And if we spend our time trying to make everybody happy, we're probably not going to make anybody happy. What do we got to do? I got to know who I am. I got to know what my purpose is. And I have to operate inside that purpose. Okay? So we don't need to worry about pleasing everyone. John 5.30, Jesus says, I only try to please the one who sent me. And listen, here's the thing. If we're Christian, if we're, if we're lovers of Jesus, and we're all seeking the will of God, and your leadership tries to do what pleases God, that should please you too. It should please you too. Even if it hurts your feelings. I've hurt feelings before. I don't do it on purpose. I can hurt feelings without trying to. I, I, you know, sometimes I do it by just being me. Sometimes I do it by trying to follow what God leads us to do. Well, I don't think we ought to do that. Well, maybe you're not in charge. Did I say that? Maybe you don't understand the purpose. Maybe you're bringing yourself, hey, here's what we need to do. We need to, you know, we need to do this or need to do that. And it, and it goes completely against the purpose of what we're about. And we don't do it and you get your feelings hurt. Sorry. But we have to do what God leads us to do. Amen? All right. So don't worry about pleasing everyone. Please God. And I believe, again... If we have a heart after Christ and we try to do what pleases God, we're going to be okay. Amen. Number six, I depend on God's power. This is Jesus instead of my own power. He says, I assure you, the Son of God, the Son, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees His Father doing. John 5, 19. We need... We need to depend on God's power. We don't need to try to accomplish everything in our life by our own ability and our own power. We need to depend on God's power. Most of the things that He's called us to do is bigger than what we are anyway. We don't need human-sized visions. We need big visions that it's going to take the power of God in order to accomplish. I can think back 15 years, Jason, to small beginnings, not knowing what we're doing. But we're trying to follow the leading of God and starting a recovery ministry for this church. Well, not just for this church, for this town, for this area. And we, you know, it was hard. It was hard getting started. It wasn't easy. But you know what? Once we made the decision to do it, it's amazing as we took steps. Because we were nervous about it. We've tried twice and it failed before. But we didn't have the people, places, and things in order for it to happen. But when that came in line and we just, we just kind of took a step of faith, it started working. And it wasn't really anything that we did other than taking that step of faith. God's power went to work because there was a tremendous need in this area for something like that. There were people who were graduating from John 3.16. They were going out and there was no kind of support for them. And the local church didn't understand their plight. And we had to learn about their plight in order to be a local church that could receive people who are in re recovery or coming out of prison or coming out of trouble. Uh, we, we had to learn how to do that and to be that kind of church. 
And it worked. And guess what? It's still working today. It's still working today. And, it, and it's, it's, not, it's not attributed to manpower. We just did the next thing in obedience. It was God's power that made it work. Amen. Number seven. <laughs> this is Jesus. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. If I'm going to think like Jesus, I have to forgive my enemies and those who hurt me. That's not easy. But we have to think differently. Have you ever been around a person that could not forgive somebody? It, it consumes them. It consumes their conversation. It consumes their lifestyle. It, can, it, it helps them make every decision that they make. They make it from the standpoint of that unforgiveness. I'm so glad that Jesus prayed that prayer. Because I was just as responsible as the people who drove the nails in his hands and his feet that he prayed for and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm as guilty as the ones who did the deed. See, me being forgiven hinges on me being willing to forgive those who have hurt me. I've hurt God. I've hurt Jesus. I've grieved the Holy Spirit. And he forgave me. I've been hurt by people. I've been hurt by circumstances and situations. And if I'm going to think like Jesus, I've got to forgive. And then I've got to move on. Whether I feel it or not, I have to move on. And I have to treat that person the way a forgiven person should be treated. Matthew 5.44 says, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you or persecute you. I don't want to, but I got to. You got it? <laughs> Number eight, I'm willing to sacrifice for others. Aren't you glad Jesus sacrificed for us? He says, I'm the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. John 10, 14, and 15. I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. This life is not just about your conveniences. It's not just about you. It's about what you can do for others. See, we need to be other people-minded if we're going to be like Jesus. Jesus didn't come... Well, this is, the, this is the part of it. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. That's Mark 10, 45. He says, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. And I've got a feeling that when we get to heaven and we see Jesus, and we, we, we see his majesty and splendor and we, we throw our crowns at his feet and we love him, that he's still going to serve us because that's the kind of God that we have. A God that is other people mind He's people-minded. And he, God exists to give and so should we. Even if it's a sacrifice. Number nine. Jesus said, I want to do God's will, not mine. John 6, 38. I came to do God's will, not mine. You know what? I've, I've discovered this. If we'll put God's will first, 
he will allow us to do some things that we want to do. But if we put our will first, we never do anything for God. It's amazing how that works. When it's me first, it's none for God. If it's God first, he blesses and allows us to do, do things that we like. We just get it backwards sometimes. Here's the last one. Jesus thought with an eternal perspective. You're not going to be here forever. The older I get, one of the things that I realize, i got more of my life here behind me than I do in front of me. I'm 72. If I live to be as old as my mom, I've got 20 years. I've got less than 20 years to live. We need to be thinking with an eternal perspective. You know, when you're, when you're a teenager, you think, well, I'm, just going, I'm going to be here forever. Well, not all teenagers are here forever. We need to have an eternal perspective. See, Jesus was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy that he knew that was before him. So how can I learn to think like Jesus? Number one, study his life and words in the Bible. Take a look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Study the way that Jesus acted. Study what he said. Study how he treated people. Look at those things and you will begin to, you'll begin to see life in a different way perspective. Hebrews 12, 2 says, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. You can't comprehend God. That's why Jesus came in the flesh. Show that, so he could show you God's ways. How God thinks. How God acts. What God's heart is like. And as you study the life of Jesus, you can do that. Second thing is, ask God how to show me the meaning and how it applies to my life today. As you look at Jesus' life, he says, okay, Lord, how does that transition into my life? You work at a job. You work with people. You, all of you ladies go to Walmart. You go somewhere and shop. You meet people. You're around people. What would Jesus do if he was at Walmart? Would he break line? Would he, I mean, no. He, he would stop and talk to people and minister to people and bless people. So as we, as we study the life of Jesus, how does that, how do I apply that to my personal life? in college, in school. How, how, do, how do we apply that to our personal lives? Our, our, our work life, our recreation life, our, our, our whole life. How do we apply that to our life? Jesus said this in John 16, 15. We're going to close with this. The Spirit will take from what I have to say and make it known to you. So what do we need to do? We need to speak life. Here, here's, here's things you need to know. You are loved. You have a purpose. You are a masterpiece. You are wonderfully made. And God has a great plan for your life. And if you'll go through this process of repenting, changing the way that you think, get out of the me first mindset and get into a different perspective as you look at Jesus and discover his life, you'll be transformed in your mind and you'll think like Jesus. Amen. Lord, we just...
We just thank you that we have the mind of Christ. Lord, help us to discover that and what that's about. Lord, take these words today and minister to our hearts and to our lives to the point that we repent, change the way that we think, that we can think like Jesus. Lord, as we study the life of Christ, show us what his heart was about and give us a heart like his. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer team, come. Let's stand and worship.